And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and the same man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Ghost was upon him. And it was revealed unto him by the Holy Ghost that he should not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he came by the Spirit into the temple. And when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him after the custom of the law, then took he him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now lettest thou thy servant depart in peace according to thy word. For mine eyes have seen thy salvation, which thou hast prepared before the face of all people. A light to lighten the Gentiles and the glory of thy people Israel. And Joseph and his mother marveled at those things which were spoken of him. And Simeon blessed them and said unto Mary his mother, Behold, this child is set for the fall and rising again of many in Israel, and for a sign which shall be spoken against. Yea, a sword shall pierce through thine own soul also. He told Mary, he said, this child is going to cause some to fall and some to rise up. And he said, and, and, and it will be spoken against. I told Pastor yesterday, I, I, don't, I don't give him counsel except in rare occasions when he asks me or any time I'm around him or we're talking or anything. But uh, I told him, I said, all, I said, just remember this, Brother Jeremy. I said, all you've got to do to get in the crosshairs of some people in our society and in our culture is have precepts that are established that you will not violate. There are precepts that are inviolable to the apostolic church. And let me tell you something, church family, before I'm going to read one more verse here in just a moment. If we let ourselves be beguiled into violating those precepts, and we decide that things that have been immutable since the days of the upper room, all of a sudden they become negotiable because of COVID or because of politics or because of whatever. Then we will, under, have to, we will find out that God will let us own the consequences of those bad decisions. Just like you've got an inheritance settled forever in the heavenlies through the blood, through the spirit, and through the name, Ethan, you get me a battery, son, good. God will let us own those consequences. Yea, a sword shall pierce through thine own also that the, uh, that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. I'm going to preach to you for a little while this morning from this subject, Beyond Bethlehem. Beyond Bethlehem. You can put your Bibles down. I didn't see many Bibles out, but you can put your Bibles down. I think that'd be a good New Year's resolution. I know you got a Bible somewhere. Bring it. We've spoiled you to these screens. Praise God, but it wouldn't hurt, it wouldn't hurt a thing in the world. I got, two, I got two Bibles right here up here on the rostrum with me. I mean, it wouldn't hurt you to bring your Bible. Amen. If you got one of them big 10-pound family Bibles, bring that. Yeah. Let everybody that sees you know you've got a big Bible, Jesus. That's right. Smile at your neighbor and say, I'm going to preach with the preacher. Amen. God bless. Thank you, gentlemen. I greet you today in the name of Jesus. It's really good to be here with my family. And I don't mean that in a trite, trivial way. It is good to be here with my family. One of the greatest things that I can ever say a, 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 a happened and established was God has given me generational people in the house of God that whenever I get old, I can get somebody to drive me to Walmart. But I can also get somebody to drive me to the house of God. It's good to be here with God's people, and it's good to be at God's house. Brother Jerry, did we make it? Did we get up and running for the internet? And it's good to have you here with us on Facebook Live today. I sure was hoping that we would get to get out on Facebook Live. I'm hoping that everybody here has had a great holiday season thus far. And 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 as you know, uh, 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 
uh, there is uh, 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 yet a few days in the holiday season. One of the golden, uh, one of the uh, uh, silver linings to the cloud of COVID-19 is maybe there won't be a Super Bowl Sunday this year. Amen. Where people do some of the most ungodly, idolatrous things like rolling a big screen TV into their sanctuary and going out in the fellowship hall and eating soup and coming back in and watching a ball game. God is not pleased with such. There's a purpose for the house of God and a people for that purpose. Oh God, help me. I feel my help coming. I realize that some may hear me say that, uh, and you're probably thinking right now, well, how in the world could Pastor feel that way? Uh, 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 We're on the brink of social and political change like we've never seen before in our nation. And folks, it is it is right around the corner. Uh, we're uh, we're uh, participating in an economy that's been altered and affected greatly. Pandemic, virus, vaccine, masks, social distancing, ridiculous rules and regulations that are being created out of thin air, coming at us so fast that we can hardly even keep up with them anymore. Anyone who thinks change can't come to, uh, quickly and come drastically must have been living in a cave or on another planet in 2020. But in the midst of it all, the upheaval, the craziness that we're experiencing, in the midst of all the turmoil in our society uh, and, and that's going on in the human race, in the midst of all the spiritual upheaval and change, in the midst of it all, Christmas came and we celebrated the birth of the Savior just a couple of days ago. Now, historically, there's not much evidence to say that December the 25th was Jesus' birthday, but it would be foolish for us to decide that we were going to celebrate it some uh, time in March or April when the rest of the whole world is celebrating it now. If we're ever going to have any godly influence, we need to try to find where, where, where we can have it at. And we certainly wouldn't have many people respond with Merry Christmas if you greeted them in July with that. So whether or not he was born on December the 25th is a moot point. The point is that we celebrate that he was born. We celebrate that he has come. We celebrate that he did not only come, but he came with a plan and he came with a purpose. Amen. The food was good this year, plentiful. The love, both spoken and unspoken, was real. The children played around the house with an innocent abandon that when they all went home and it got quiet, I told my wife, I said, you know, it, it, it was kind of noisy around here, but I said this was so good today. All of our our, our adult children were were uh, uh, assuming the roles of so, that society has appointed for them, and all of our little children scampering around there. They had so much to play with that they were just frenetic. They would just run from one thing to another and jerk it open and, and grab at it and throw it up up in there and run to something else and and and. Uh, but they were just having so much fun, and I thought to myself, they're innocent. They don't think a thing in the world about liberalism and homosexual uh, uh, agendas and gender blurring and all of that craziness that's going on in our society. I will, I will one day be labeled a hate speaker because I'm going to tell you what the Word of God says about stuff. Once again, heaven's love and purpose Blended with man's remembrances and devotions. And, from, for, and for those who claim Christ and those who keep his word and those that remember what we are really celebrating, the joy of Christmas was uh, 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 all at once. It was exhilarating. It was satisfying. It was fulfilling. I know we all get, get food weary and get gift weary and get event weary uh, over the holiday season. But I'm going to tell you, for one, I love Christmas more now than I did when I was a little boy. I really do. And I loved it as a little boy. But I love it now more than ever. The joy of Christmas. So you say, well, what's the point? The point is Christmas Day, the day itself, is just one in 365 other days of the year. But the idea is part and parcel of a life view. Amen. Now about July, mid-July, we won't be thinking anything about the outward trappings of the season. There won't be many people. Well, there, there'll still be some. I see some people that just leave their lights up across the front of their house all year long. 
That way you don't have to keep taking them down and putting them back up again. But if you go by there and it's the 4th of July and there are Christmas lights out, it kind of uh, sucks all the funny out of putting them up for Christmas, don't it? So, with that said, we focused this week on something very important psychologically to us. In the South, in July, you're not worried about Christmas. You're just hoping that the air conditioner makes one more season. And the grass wouldn't grow like a rainforest and have to be mowed about every four days. But yet the purpose and the plan and the idea, the overarching idea should be our source of joy, whether it be winter, spring, summer, or fall. The idea, amen, in good times, the idea that God came ought to be something for us. In bad times, it ought to be something special to us. Our peace shouldn't and cannot be predicated upon political or economic ideas. We should never let what's going on around us ruin what God is doing in us. The first Christmas was basically unnoticed except for a few angels and shepherds and the best of my understanding, they didn't have any Wi-Fi or cell phone signal. I'll let y'all think about that in a minute. Only a few shepherds on a lonely cold hillside basically went unnoticed they didn't have uh, they didn't have Instagram or Facebook so that they could take pictures and post what they saw what they just saw amen the first Christmas went unnoticed so his coming in flesh God incarnate was unheralded and unheeded by most of the world but he said I'm going to come anyway I'm not coming just so that men can herald me as a historical event and the head of some movement. He came to fulfill the plan that's been in place since the foundation of the world. He came with authority and power to undo what the will of fallen mankind had done to ourselves. He came to restore the light of the world into the hearts and upon the paths of what he considered to be his crowning work of creation, man. He came that all people everywhere might once again have the chance to reflect the glory and the image of their creator and to restore what was fallen and lost in us. He came to destroy the yoke of darkness and evil, of ignorance and arrogance and pride. He came to overcome rebellion, selfishness, self-will. He came to be the light of the world. And that, that light would be the life of men. John said, in, in him was light, and the light was the life of men. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. He came so that the greed and the power-mad philosophies that are driving an agenda of fear and dread in our world would not have the power to destroy our sanity and our peace. Let me tell you, the dread and the fear that grips our society today is not of God. If God stirs, uh, God is not given, uh, you say, well, how can you prove that? God has not given us a spirit of fear but of power and of love and of a sound mind. I think about how scriptures fit into context and it said not not a spirit of fear, but a love, power, and of a sound mind. That tells me that a person who succumbs to fear, who's supposed to be full of the Holy Ghost, that completely, absolutely gets swallowed up by a spirit of terrorizing fear, have lost their mind. maybe not lost their mind, but they lost the power of the soundness of their mind. I, I saw, a, this is an aside, I saw a, 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 a little documentary on the internet a few days ago, a little, a little homemade documentary. A man was interviewing uh, uh, some Hasidic Jews. In, in Brooklyn, New York, there's three neighborhoods combined together that constitute 
one of the biggest enclaves of, of Jewish people outside of Israel. There's 250,000 Hasidic Jews that live in Brooklyn in three neighborhoods, uh, adjoining neighborhoods in Brooklyn. I don't know if, if people know that or not. The Hasidic Jews are the ones that you see the man with the little bowl hat and he's got the curls coming out from underneath. They're, they're very orthodox, very conservative Jews. And they asked one of those people, they said, uh, the, one of those Jewish people, they said, why is it that uh, our culture and the people that are supposed to be our leaders seem to be so terrified and, and shaken by everything that's going on, but yet your people seem to be at rest and at peace in the midst of all this. That person answered and said, well, it's really very simple. Said people that don't have the right relationship or don't have a relationship with Hashem, they won't say his name, they say Hashem, which means the name. They say that out of respect for the reverence of the name of God. They said the people that don't have a relationship with Hashem, they said they think that they have all the answers and in their hearts they know that they don't know what to do. They know that they don't have an answer in the midst of all of this. And the reason that it strikes such terror and they make up dumb rules and every day you get up and there's a new set of dumb rules to follow. How in the world can it be okay to walk into a restaurant with a mask on and sit down and take it off and eat? And then put it back on again to walk out. You can't make that kind of dumb stuff up. Either, either one perspective, Brother Greg, or the other's right. Either wear it or don't wear it. I'm not, I'm not advocating either way. I'm just telling you that well, uh, walking by somebody and putting it on and then sitting down and taking it off. While somebody that God knows where they've been and what they've been doing brings your food. That person answered that interviewer and said, it's because man can't figure out the answers and he's terrified now because secular culture and society realizes that they can't get a handle on what's going on. God said he came to destroy greed and power mad philosophy. Whatever comes, whatever goes, whatever comes and won't go. We cannot let any of that cause us to forget that He came to give us power over all, somebody said it, all the power of our enemies. He came to show us a better way to live and a better place to look forward to living in the future. He came armed with promise, armed with a plan, armed with power. And He told us that when this earthly mission was fulfilled, that the power from on high would fill us with the Holy Ghost and it would not be Christ with us, it would be Christ in us, the hope of glory. And that no weapon formed against us should prosper and that none of the denizens of darkness can dissuade us from our higher purpose unless we just give in to it and allow it. If we truly have been filled with the Holy Ghost, we need to quit blaming the devil for everything. Praise God. Y'all don't need to say that again. If we're full of the Holy Ghost, we need to quit blaming the devil for everything. Y'all remember the story? I've told it many times. Some of you have heard it so many times you could tell it for me probably. But some of you never have heard it. Uh, a man walking down the street one day and he got to the uh, corner of the street and there was the devil sitting under the street light just a cry, just a boo-hooing away. The man said, well, devil, what's the matter with you? He said, I just came from the Pentecostal church. He said, you ought to hear what they're blaming on me. Folks, Adam got us into this merely at the suggestions of the enemy. He did not make Adam do anything. He did not make Eve do anything. 
We do not have, uh, we, ought not, uh, uh, we ought not have the caveat of everything that, uh, 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 that's not right and everything that's unpleasant for us is something that the devil did. Satan is not omniscient. Can I, give you a, can I get a witness? He is omniscient. Uh, uh, um, he's not omniscient. That means, uh, omniscient means knows everything. He does not know everything. He is a created being. He does not have the omniscient full understanding of everything that God knows. And he cannot make us do anything. Yes, he does know that man's will can cause man to fall. He's been watching people for 6,000 years now. He can pretty much surmise what most people would do given a set of circumstances. Yes, he was there when Adam and Eve hid themselves in nakedness and shame. But what the devil doesn't know is how much God loved you. He does not have any idea. He had no idea what extent God would go to to get back that which he loved and cared about. Can I get a witness from somebody at the Pentecostals of the Miss Lou this morning? Amen. The devil didn't know how much God cared. The devil didn't know how much God loved. God, the devil didn't know how far God would go. Amen. To get back that which belonged to him and that he cherished. Amen. 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 You can be seated. God did not counsel with anybody when he decided that I'm going to come in flesh. He did not have to have the counsel of, uh, of heaven to decide that he was going to pay the penalty for sin and satisfy heaven's justice. Substituting himself, sinless as he was, for us to wit that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. Folks, that's a grand revelation. I would to God that, uh, that holiness people could get their heads uh, uh, back in the game and quit worrying about what you need to do or don't need to do or where you can go or whether you can go to the movies or putt-putt golf and all that kind of stuff or whether you can wear this or say that or watch this or do that. I wish to God that some people would get their mind back on the fact that we are the people of the revelation of the mighty God in Christ. I'm telling you, a lot of the things that we struggle and wrestle with in our minds and in our flesh, uh, 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 frustrated and exasperated over, would all go away if we'd fall in love with the fact that God manifest Himself in flesh, was seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, and received up into glory. Who was God was? The reason we baptize in the name of Jesus is because it's the name that God revealed when he came. I'm part of the family of God and the only way that I can be part of the family of God is if I've been down in water, circumcised, buried with him in water, baptism in the name of Jesus Christ. came today to tell us that beyond Bethlehem the eternal plan of God unfolded and is still unfolding today. It's unfolding past every worry and every fear and every anger and every unforgiveness. It's unfolding past all the ugliness and the ungodliness that fallen man has foisted upon himself by exerting his human will against the authority and the sovereignty of God. Now I'm preaching now. But if we are to have it, it can't be just some warm, fuzzy emotion for a few days or a few hours in December. But rather, it's got to be a vital, purposeful, intentional perspective and life view that we are going to have every day. When Abraham's covenant took place, the Bible says God said, kill those animals and cut them in two. There were no street lights. There were no electric generators. There was no power sources. It was dark. And when the night fell, the scripture says that Abraham was standing there with bloody carcasses all around him. And all of a sudden, in the midst of all of that death and destruction, a light shined. And that light passed between Abraham and all that bloody death. I want to tell you what I know today. Jacob had 
a place where an angel come and touched him. And when he did, light burst out of heaven and shone into that dark place where Jacob got his identity changed. Bethlehem's angels showed themselves on the hillside and the Bible says, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them. Pentecost came with wind and fire and set upon them. It came with light and power. God always steps in with light between you and the bloody death. that you inherited from the first Adam. All we're trying to do in this life is shed the remnants and the vestiges of the first Adam's failure so that we can take on the light and the life of the second Adam from heaven. You can distill all theology down to one thing. In him was life. Life was the light of men. Not the second person in some mysterious triune Godhead that nobody can explain. But the mighty God in Christ. Reconciling the world. For unto us a child was born and a son given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder. And his name shall be called Wonderful. Counselor, Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, and the Prince of Peace. Simeon lived his whole life waiting for a promise that he felt like he knew from the Word of God had been prophesied. And he spent his whole life waiting for that promise to be accomplished and fulfilled. Simeon lived his whole life knowing that the purpose and the consolation of God was coming. He didn't know when. He didn't know how. He didn't know exactly what the circumstances would be sociologically, philosophically, politically, economically. He had no clear insights into that. He just knew that what he knew about God's promise was transcendent. And that God's transcendent power and promise would make this happen regardless of what was going on in the world around him. And I want to tell the Pentecostal church, I want to tell the apostolic church, I want to tell everybody out there in cyberspace and all you precious darlings here under the sound of my voice at P-O-N-L, there is nothing that's going to stop God from doing what God intends to do. Simeon knew that it was coming. So therefore, he did not decide to spend his life hanging out at the mall. He did not decide to bury himself in Hollywood or social media or entertainments. He did not decide to hinge all of his expectancies and hopes on Wall Street or God forbid, Washington, D.C. If a person is to find God, you listen to me. If a person is to find God, you will find him at his house. I hear people say, well, uh, I don't have to go to church to worship God. You didn't get that out of the Bible. I can, I can worship God sitting under, the, under a tree on the banks of a river. No, you can't. You can contemplate the reality of God. But if you're going to really find God, you're going to find God where His people and His Word and His preaching and His Spirit all come together. And, and there, can, I give you a, can I help you just for just a couple of minutes? Pastor, please uh, 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 grant me my liberty for just a couple of minutes. I want to I wanna help you out a little bit here. Amen. God does not have to give any explanation to why He chose 
his plan to be as it is. People say, well, I just don't see why I got to do that. Well, the reason you got to do that is because the sovereignty of God said it and there is no why. You know why the devil raises such an argument and a complaint about separated, consecrated, holiness living? Because if he can get you to question God's sovereignty about that, then anything that he wants to get you to start questioning about God is on the table then. If he can get you to wondering about why there's gender distinctions, that are delineated by uh, hair and clothing. And that there's a role that the feminine gender plays in society and a role that the male gender plays in society, or, or, or f f I say plays functions in, in society. And that those distinctions go all the way back to the first order of creation. The first covenant... Are you ready? And I said I wasn't going to get off on this this morning, but I've but I done done it now. The first order of creation established in the very first of the Bible, God made something very clear. He said, I'm the creator, and you're the creation. And everything flows out from that. Well, I'll tell you what, I'm going to, I'm going to, uh, I'll live for God, but I'll just find me somewhere that'll let me do it the way I want to. No, you won't. No, you won't. Because if you have to have something other than what the sovereign creator established, then you're not really living for God. And if he can get you to decide that you can question everything that the preacher gives you as far as lifestyle, holiness, separation, consecration, doctrine. If he can get you to question in that, then, then one day you'll be sitting around playing uh, uh, on your uh, iPhone and the devil will slip up beside you and say, hey, does God really have, is God really the sovereign creator? Is he really the sovereign creator of the universe? Because once you start unraveling the tenets of the covenant, everything becomes negotiable then. And you know what you'll find yourself doing one of these days? You'll find yourself saying, well, well I just don't believe i got to do that. Thank you. Pastor says you'll be backslidden. He's exactly right. I think, I told my wife this morning, getting ready for church, I said, I thank God for a, for a church that pre preaches backsliddenness. I said, I've been places and, and grew up in, 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 in certain philosophies where, where there was no such thing as backsliding. And my mind said, well, my God, what happened? Well, what am I then if I'm not? Because I knew I was backslidden. And I didn't, and wasn't even supposed to be no, any such thing as backsliding, but I knew I was backslidden. I knew I wasn't right with God. I thank God for a place that preaches backsliding. Because unless we own our backsliddenness, we cannot own the remedy. And unless we own God as sovereign and has the right to choose what he wants to be, then you know what happens eventually? We reverse the roles and we're the creator and he's the creation. And that's what the Bible said happened in the book, first chapter of the book of Romans. It said that they, uh, because they chose not to retain the knowledge of God, God gave them over to a reprobate mind and they decided that they would not hold on to the things of God anymore and that they would worship the creation above the Creator. My God. Am I doing all right? You will find Him at the house of God, attending to God's Word, God's truth. When He came, Simeon took Him and He embraced Him. Oh, 
In just a few days, I'll be celebrating 41 years of this, and I still get excited when I think about the prospect of what I discovered in that little country church 41 years ago. I walked in there, and the song service started, and before they got halfway through the first song, conviction fell on me, and I made my way to an altar, and those men gathered around me, and those women gathered around my wife. That's the way we used to do it back in those days. The saints of God felt it was compelled to come around the altar and pray people through. That's, that's, that's old-fashioned. Pentecost when the saints pray the, uh, the, uh, the unregenerate back through to the Holy Ghost or pray them through the backsliders and the sinners or prayed through by the saints not now God I embraced it I said oh I don't ever want to. I put my guitar aside I put it up and told God I won't ever play it again if that's what's required of me, God. I, I, I just, it just rankles something inside of me when I hear people want to make ignorant statements like, well, old Harrington thinks that's a big show and it's all about him. You can't be, you'd be surprised at the time down through the years Satan sends somebody along to say something, something stupid like that. First of all, this ain't a show. dare you indict the integrity of what God has asked us to do and be. And I put it up and said, I'll never play it again. And within just a matter of weeks, my pastor said, oh no, you ain't going to do that. Uh-uh. Uh-uh. And the reason I play the way I do is because I was raised on an AM radio listening to Buck Owens and Hank Williams, I mean Hank Williams, not Hank Williams Jr. He wasn't around then. Merle Haggard and George Jones and the Temptations. And you wonder, you wonder where all of that comes from. It comes from, uh, from, the, from the fabric of the experience. I'm not trying to be anybody. Honestly, folks, Y'all hear me play, and I have so much fun. But at best, I'm just a, just a moderately skilled weekender. I know some of y'all think that, that I ought to be cutting records in Nashville. That just shows how limited your musical understanding is. Amen. Yeah, the one good thing about me, Pastor, is I know how limited I am. I've heard people that was a lot worse than me and thought they ought to be in Nashville. It ain't a show. And we ain't doing it to satisfy anybody. And are certainly not doing it to satisfy my ego. That's the reason some people get all chapped and chafed at me sometimes. I ain't going to stroke your ego. Not much. You hear him? You hear him? I know they can't hear you online. He said, if that's the only way you can survive, then you're not going to survive. God's book of Acts Church everywhere needs to do this. Amen. We need to rejoice in him. We need to embrace him. We need to hold him tight. I say to P.O.M.L. today, it's time for God's apostolic book of Acts Church everywhere to fall in love afresh and anew with Jesus. This has been a difficult and a perplexing year. I recommend to us that we take the next few days and hit the reset button in our spiritual lives. Recalibrate. The scripture says consider our ways. Make our calling and election sure. And for anyone who decides to do something else, I just want to say to you once again, we love you here. And if some of the things I just said uh, uh, rubbed you the wrong way, you need to turn the cat around. For anyone who decides to be something else, be assured. The house of God, the people of God, God himself loves you. But the story of Simeon in, in, ends with these words. He said, many will fall and many will rise because of your coming. Anytime, oh my God, uh, revelation. Anytime God is about to show himself in a, in a significant 
powerful manifestation, demonstration to humanity. There's always going to be something that's going to rise up and some are going to fall and some are going to rise. And the Bible says that in the process of that, the hearts of many will be revealed. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth will speak. In times when God decides to show up and manifest himself overtly and emphatically in a culture and in a society, be assured there will be those that will rise, there will be those that will fall. But God's going to reveal hearts. We are entering a paradigm unlike the modern world has ever known. There's things about to take place in our society and in our world. Be assured, COVID's not the end of the things that are going to come upon humanity. Just like Pharaoh of old, the only time that the plague had any bearing on him was when it was, he was in the midst of the throes of it. As soon as that plague lifted, he went right on back to being an idolater. 9-11 did not. Oh, we're going to be patriotic. We're going to be stalwart. Yeah, that lasted, what, about a week and a half? Many and most in Simeon's day found other things to occupy the quantity of their days and the quality of their days. God's sovereignty will always allow mankind to choose and God's sovereignty will always demand that you own the consequences of your choices. Beyond Bethlehem, there's hope. Beyond Bethlehem, there's help. And more importantly today, if you're here today and you've never been born again, the Bible says that you must repent of your sins. You must be baptized into the name of God, which is Jesus Christ. And you must be filled with the Holy Ghost. You must embrace this. You must hold it. You must lift it up. You must rejoice in it. You must always be sure that what is ahead of you is better and transcendent and more powerful and more glorious than what you're going through right now. If you're here today and you're backslidden, you can come to the altar and God will fix that for you. If you're here today and you're dissatisfied with where your life has drifted off to, this place is still the place to find the consolation of Israel. We're living beyond Bethlehem. And what are we going to do with it? I want you to stand with me, heads bowed, eyes closed. Amen. We don't have any keyboards over there this morning, but that's all right because uh, the original, the original up room didn't have a music program anyway. There were no, there were no bands and no sound systems and no microphones and no amplifiers out there on the hillside that day. It was just angels declaring the glory of the Lord. So I ask you today, if you're here today and you've never been born again, if you're here today and you're backslidden or you're just dissatisfied and uncomfortable with where your life has drifted to, the altar's now open. God is calling you beyond.